All right, uh, so this is problem two. Uh, and so problem two is gonna involve an application of the gibbs duhem equation. So at least get the problem set up. I don't know if we'll be able to take it to completion. Um, oftentimes, some of these problems can be a little time consuming in terms of um, the calculus that needs to be performed, uh, plus my recollection sometimes of um, uh, indefinite integrals or definite integrals on the spot could be uh, a little rusty. <laughs> and so I might have to go look them up in a, a table, but uh, we'll at least walk through uh, how to set it up and how to take this to uh, completion. Um, and also when it comes to some of these problems which involve um, a lot of calculus, it very well may be that you find a better way to do it or a simpler way to do it or more efficient way to do it, uh, and that's fine. I'll at least take you through uh, how to set it up um, and, and how to get the answer. Okay, and so uh, we're told we have a binary system of species one and two at fixed temperature and pressure. Uh, we're given an expression for the partial molar enthalpy of species one, um, so that's H bar one. So partial molar enthalpy of component one is a function of composition. And then we're also told that we know the pure component enthalpy of species two. And so we're asked using only the provided information, can you determine expressions for uh, H bar two and H as a function of X1? And if so, um, what are they? Okay, uh, so first I'm gonna write down the three key expressions or the three, yeah, the three key expressions we'll, we'll use, okay? So expression one is gonna be the gibbs duhem equation. Okay, so gibbs duhem equation is our zero sum requirement. Okay, so in general, we would have the sum over i, xi, the f bar i is equal to zero, where f bar i, or f, is our arbitrary thermodynamic state function. So f bar i would be the partial molar f of species i in my mixture. Okay, so that's property one, or expression one. Okay, property two that we'll exploit in getting h bar two, uh, that'll typically go hand in hand with an application of the gibbs duhem equation is remember in the pure component limit, so the limit that say xi goes to one, f bar i is equal to fi. So in the pure component limit, my partial molar f is just equal to my pure component f, right? So these are gonna be the two properties we'll exploit to get h bar two, and in general, uh, and problems evolving use of the gibbs duhem equation, all right, this is gonna be a property that we'll exploit, okay? And basically the idea is, is, you know, in our gibbs duhem equation or zero sum requirement, here we have a differential of f bar i, okay? Whenever I differentiate something, I lose a piece of information, okay? So, you know, the differential, it's, you know, a differential change, right? So it's a change in f bar i. So the issue is, is if I want the absolute value, so if I were to integrate f bar i, I know f bar i within a constant, because if I were to take that function and I were to you know, shift it up or down um, you know, in, in space, uh, the slope is unchanged, right? So the issue is whenever I have a differential or I differentiate something, I lose a piece of information, right? So that if I were to integrate it or take the antiderivative, derivative, I only know the function within uh, a constant. Right, and so where we'll often exploit this property, right, then is if I were to integrate it, if when I integrate, you know, my differential, I know my function within a constant, this is gonna be the piece of information we'll use to pin down our, our constant, okay? The third expression we'll use uh, to eventually get h, once you know h bar two, is remember that h, or well, h, and so I guess just f, right, if you keep it in general, is gonna be equal to sum over i, xi, f bar i, right? The molar average of my partial molar properties, okay? All right, so if we get to business for this problem, okay? So knowing h bar one and h two to get h bar two, we're gonna exploit the gibbs duhem equation, okay? So if we apply this for binary system using h in term instead of f, I would have that x one, h bar one plus x2, h bar two, well, and actually I need to write this correctly, x1, dh bar one plus x2, dh bar two is equal to zero, okay? So next I'm gonna bring h bar two, um, actually let's bring h bar one over to the right hand side since what I'm ultimately gonna be interested in is h bar two, although it doesn't matter, you'll get the same thing. 
So I'm going to rewrite this as x2 dh bar 2 is equal to negative x1 dh bar 1. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is this is a differential of h bar 2 and a differential of h bar 1. So uh, this corresponds to you know in, uh, infinitesimally small change in h bar 2 and h bar 1. What I'm going to do is I'm going to divide through by divide my differentials through by dx1. Okay. Why dx1 and not dx2? Well, they're one and the same. But if I, I'm going to use dx1 because I know I have here h bar 1 as a function of x1. Right? They're one and the same. If you had one, you could interchange, you get the other. Okay. So I'm going to divide my differentials through by dx1. So now instead of just having an expression involving differentials, right, now this is an actual differential. Right? This is you know, the change in uh, differential change in h bar 2 relative to differential change in um, x1. All right, so it's a differential, uh, more as if you would have seen it in your uh, calculus one class. Okay, so rearranging a little further. Okay, I have that dh bar two. Okay, dx one is equal to negative x one over x two. Dh bar one. Dx one. Okay, cool. So. Um, and actually, okay, let's take it a step further then before I even tried to plug something in. Okay, what I'll do next is I'll multiply both sides by dx1. So I'm not going to cancel these dx1 terms, and we'll explain that in a second. So that I get d, oh, dh bar 2 is equal to negative x1 over x2 dh bar 1 dx1 dx1. Okay. All right, then once I have my expression in this form, okay, and maybe just for completeness, instead of x2, okay, I can write that as one minus x1, okay? So I have negative x1 over one minus x1, dh bar one, dx1, dx1, okay? So before we even were to try and simplify uh, anything, okay, to give you the general picture, the next move is I'm gonna integrate. Okay, so I'm going to evaluate, uh, I'm going to perform, I'm going to calculate essentially the indefinite integral. Okay, so the idea is if I were to perform my indefinite integral, all right, I'm going to get h bar 2 on the left hand side within a constant. All right, so I'm going to, when you take the antiderivative of something, you get, say, in this case, h bar 2, right, plus a constant, right, plus a constant of integration. We get a constant of integration. When we have a definite integral and we have those fixed limits, um, well then, you know, you know, all is good. The other way you can picture it in this case is you can think of it as integrating from, you know, my x1 of interest or some arbitrary x1 uh, to my pure component limit where we'll pin down the value. Okay, but uh, it's easier just to think of it as my uh, indefinite integral, and so what I would get is this would result in h bar two is equal to the integral of negative x1 over 1 minus x1 dh bar 1 dx1 dx1 plus a constant plus my constant of integration all right and so essentially <laughs> what happens then or why I say these things are so challenging is that what I'm left with is I need to perform this indefinite integral then after I perform that indefinite integral how I pin down the value of c is in the limit that x1 goes to 0, which would correspond to x2 goes to 1, h bar 2 is equal to h2. Okay, So I get my expression in this form. I um, calculate the indefinite integral. And when I calculate the indefinite integral, okay, I get h bar 2 within a constant, with my constant of integration. How I pin down that constant of integration c is okay in the limit that you know x2 goes to 1, which would be equivalent to x1 goes to 0, h bar 2 would be equal to h2, and we're given the value of h2. Okay? Um, and so that's basically how it goes, and that's why I say I probably won't be able to completely work it out, uh, but I can try and take it a little further um, and let me try and take a little further just to show you how we'd massage that um, right hand side down. Okay, so we're told that 
Okay, I'm gonna have to probably look up a, in pieces. H bar one is equal to, and I've already forgotten, 420, 420 minus 60 x1 squared plus 40 x1 cubed. Okay, so with h bar one, ah, <laughs> the race button, all right? 420, ah, oh, I even have to look at it. Okay, and it's kind of cool even just looking at this equation. So, you know, what is h1? Well, the limit that x1 goes to one, I'd have 420 um, minus 60 plus 40, so that'd be minus 20, all right? So getting off on a tangent, h1 would just be, oh, what did I say? Uh, negative 20 would be 400, and I believe that was joules per mole, right? So I could calculate h1 if I wanted to, okay? But as for the problem at hand, okay, um, Oh, so as for the problem at hand, um, here I have this term dh1 dx1. And so what I would do then is I would take h bar one and I would differentiate it with respect to x1, okay? So dh bar one dx1 would be equal to what? Okay, the, so differential of 420 with respect to x1 would just be zero. So minus 60 x1 squared. So I bring down the two, so it'd be negative 120 x1 okay plus here bring down the 3 so that'd be plus 120 x1 squared okay or if I were to factor out the 120 I have 120 I actually factor out the 120 times x1 120 times x1 and I have x1 ooh cool yeah, let's write it as x1 minus 1. Okay, cool. Okay, and what I say that's kind of cool is, you know, if I were to simplify it, this is just x2, right? Since x1 plus x2 is equal to 1, well, so then x1 minus 1 would be negative x2. All right, but, uh, but we won't quite do that simplification. So that would reduce this to negative 120 um, x1 times x2, okay? But let's leave it as this because we want just x1, okay? And so what they would tell me then, if I were to plug this in, okay, I have h bar two then is equal to integral negative x1 divided by one minus x1. Uh, now here I could plug in 120 x1 times x1 minus 1 dx1 plus c okay cool maybe I'll be able to simplify this a little bit because peaking okay I see here 1 minus x1 that's x1 minus 1 so actually I could flip this guy around and change the sign here so I could rewrite this then is x1 minus 1 x1 minus 1, we then cancel this, x1 minus 1, and so I have h bar 2 is equal to integral, okay, so now I have x1 times 120x1, so that should be 120x1 squared dx1 plus c. All right, maybe I will be able to do this, okay. So then if I were to integrate this, I have h bar two is equal to, it almost seems too easy. So integral of 120 x1 squared would be one third um, 120 x1 cubed plus c, okay, I think. So, uh, and then that would reduce to 40 x1 cubed plus c, okay, so if that's right, okay, so I have h bar two is equal to 40 x1 cubed plus c, and so we know that in the limit that x1, or let's say x2 goes to one, which would be equivalent to x1 goes to zero, okay, 
of the x2 goes to 1, or x1 goes to 0, of h bar 2, okay? Okay, so if I plug in x1 equals 0, that's just c, and that's equal to h2, okay? And so h2 was, h2 was 600, okay? That's equal to 600, 600 joules per mole, okay? So I take it back. If, if I haven't messed anything up, um, then this one was a little tamer than I thought. So I have h bar 2 then is equal to 40 x1 cubed uh, plus 600, um, and that's in joules per mole. Hey, and one thing that's cool, yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> so if this is h2, I know that h bar 2 then is always going to be greater than h2, because um, x1 will always be uh, you know, greater than 0, right? So I'm going to have some positive contribution. So h bar 2 should be uh, greater than uh, h2. Okay, cool. So as long as I haven't goofed anything up, that's that part of it. Okay. And then if I were to get one expression for h, right, h would just be x1 h bar 1 plus x2 h bar 2 okay um, and I would just have to work out the math for that okay um, so plug in h bar 2 as I have it here plug in um, h bar 1 right which I have here um, and simplify okay I won't uh, go through that because that should be uh, pretty straightforward but that's problem two